Henry Iring was a very outstanding theoretical chemist. He was wonderfully enterprising. He opened new frontiers in several important areas of physical chemistry. If I'm dealing with a, a group of 100 professional scientists, and I bring up his name, 90-something will know it. If I were to ask people, name me one of the last three Nobel laureates in chemistry, not five people in the room will tell you. Certainly in the, in the 20th century, uh, he's at the top. I mean, you, you might put two or three with him, but uh, he's at the top. He was a concept uh, when I was an undergraduate student. Then, of course, to actually meet him in person when I came to Utah was tremendous. I mean, it was like, um, meeting a, a divine personality or somebody that you revered from your early days. I couldn't think of a single person who more influenced the thought of science in the 20th century than he did. No one, literally no one. Henry Iring, after a very outstanding, groundbreaking work at Princeton, astonished the world by moving to Utah to accept uh, the invitation to create a graduate school in science. And of course, he had huge impact there. You have a, a quality name who's done quality work at Princeton, well known, and comes here to this area of the country that did not have a graduate school. Uh, the Intermountain West higher education and the quality of it, which keeps going up and up and is uh, more and more well known, started because Henry came to U University of Utah. Henry explained to me once how it happened. He mentioned in the evening to his wife that he had this phone call from Salt Lake City suggesting that perhaps he might be interested in uh, returning to Salt Lake City to take over, uh, start graduate school. And he you know, turned it down. His wife, he says, didn't really say much that evening, but the following day she asked him, well, have you accepted that uh, position at Utah? He said, well, I know, I'm in this, you know, Princeton. And she said, well, you're not proposing to live in exile forever, are you? <laughs> he was a big figure with enormous potential. And for him to come to the University of Utah, we just like a light going on, the signal. He's here and some important things are going to happen. It gave people a reason to look for higher horizons. It gave people reason to have faith in the long term. You don't achieve excellence in science overnight. It takes time. And time takes patience and it takes support. It takes money. And he showed what a career of excellence could do over its lifespan. It certainly uh, moved uh, Utah way up in the uh, pantheon of places where outstanding science was being done. He was so free of pomposity. He would race the graduate students, you remember, even when he was losing in these later years. <laughs> he wasn't proud about that. It's race day, weather clear, track fast, and Dr. Eyring is the clear favorite. Not the favorite to win, just the favorite. <laughs> he ran those foot races, I think, to bring himself down to the level, at least in the minds of, of, of other people, he always considered himself at the level of the common man, but he'd, he'd do things that would help those who might otherwise uh, fear to interact with him. So the students were uh, somewhat at a loss. So should we really try very hard and beat him to that uh, goal line? Or should we pretend that we're trying and can't quite make it? Some of the students, of course, couldn't because he was pretty good, even at that age. He would jump on a desk, I gather, which eliminated boundaries. He would take a total stranger like myself, or anybody else for that matter. It could be a colleague, a very distinguished colleague, or a janitor, and uh, he would treat everybody in a very kind way. Absolute rate theory is, after all the study I've given it, completely beyond my ken. 
Now, the good news is that most scientists I've talked with feel the same way. His absolute ray theory just applied it to even earthquakes, I think it was. I mean, it was virtually everything that happens can be couched within Eyring's absolute ray theory. The fact that he is remembered today and that he's cited in, Henry is cited in science as much today as he was when he died. That's a legacy. So it's a very major, I would say, even monumental contribution that will abide uh, forever, I think, in uh, chemistry. He'll be one of the very few people who'll still have half a page in a scientific textbook talking about him 400 years from now. He's the only guy I've ever, ever heard the debate about why didn't he get it. And I mean, I've heard this debate a hundred times, and 80 of them were outside of Utah that I heard the debate. I've never heard that debate about any other individual. Ultimately, it doesn't really matter all that much uh, whether you get it or not. At least that's how Henry would have seen it, I'm sure. What you accomplish and how you transform lives of other people and what legacy you leave behind is what really matters. Oh, I'm sure it mattered, but it, it matters to like, um, is it really going to kill you you didn't play for the New York Yankees? No. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, it wasn't the biggest worry on his mind. He viewed the, the joy of the understanding that he would gain, I think, far more than the joy of the uh, recognition. But his joy was there in the laboratory and in the classroom doing the work. The discovery for him was the, was the joy of it. And that was true, by the way, if, uh, if the latest dis discovery disproved an earlier discovery. Uh, he was happy to prove himself wrong if it was uh, advancing truth. He represented a scientist who can communicate science. I was a student at the University of Utah, of course, and graduated from that institution. I noticed that uh, those students who knew of Henry Iring flocked to his classes. And if they couldn't register for them, they'd show up for the lectures standing room only, even though they were not getting any credit for the course. I believe he never gave a lecture, but what, the place was full. I've seen him talk to kids, and I've seen him talk to doormen, and I've seen him talk to college students, and I've seen him talk to adults who know nothing about science. There was a mailman who for years came to the, the dean's office and, and would stop and talk to the secretaries. And, and uh, he used his uh, prerogative as, as dean when the man retired to give him an actual PhD. It ticked people off tremendously, but uh, that's just the way he saw the world. Henry had three sons born to, to him and to his wife, Mildred Benyon Iring, uh, the oldest, Edward, uh, followed in his father's footsteps very effectively, became a chemist and uh, has had a, an outstanding career at the University of Utah. I would say he was one of my favorite professors because he was so approachable and so accommodating. And he was like that with every single student. On the first day of class, he made an effort to get to know everyone's name. He asked us to tell us, tell him a little bit about ourselves. I've just come from a meeting where I have had the chance to read letters of recommendation written by Professor Iring, in this case now Ted Iring, for some of his students. And every time he writes a letter, they are meaningful, they're thoughtful, they represent some knowledge, real knowledge of the student. They're never perfunctory. I think Professor Iring's legacy is going to be one of Sincerity, openness, kindness, someone who's very well accomplished in his field. His second son, Henry Benyon Iring, who uh, went by Hal from the moment his, his mother uh, uh, said, you can call him Henry, you can name him Henry, but I'll call him Hal. Hal Iring always carries with him a smile, and he relates to the student. He's mo more of a... Uh, a tutor 